Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Food of the Gods by H.G. Wells. Dane reads. So, this is a Sphere Science Fiction edition. Obviously, H.G. Wells is known for like The War of the Worlds and The Time Machine. Although, I actually think this ranks up there with the best of his work, you know? So, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Giants at large on Earth. Not only animal and plant giants, but human giants too. And all the result of an unfortunate accident. A slip which released the food of the gods to an unsuspecting world. Such was the power of the food that no one could control it. Almost everything which came into contact with it began to grow and kept on growing. The problems grew worse when those who had avoided the food began to think the giants were threatening them. So the little people went to war. It was a case of eat, destroy, or be destroyed. So I just really like that concept of this food that makes you massive, you know? And, um,. There's a little introduction here. Let me see, who is it written by? Uh, George Hay, chairman of the H.G. Wells Society. Um, and I just want to read out a couple of the, the little bits here. So, I can't recall any comments by C.S. Lewis on this novel specifically. It would be interesting to have them. The book is the quintessential of the worldview that Lewis loathed and parodied so well in Out of the Silent Planet. To grow according to the will of God, to grow out of these cracks and crannies, out of these shadows and darkness, into greatness and the light, thus the children of the food. Lewis would have taken them to be speaking of Antichrist rather than God. Well, the reader will make up his own mind on these issues. Perhaps he will be tempted to think both views are relevant. If so, I hope he will resist that temptation. The greatness of Wells was such that he remains very much our contemporary. He wrote this about the food of the gods. Here you have the completest statement of the conception that human beings are in violent reaction to a profound change in conditions, demanding the most complex and extensive readjustments in the scope and scale of their ideas. That sentence desperately needs a comma in it. Uh, again, I want to read this bit as well. The whole novel, of course, is one vast analogy. The food was a metaphor for the revolution of ideas that was at that time shattering the crust of post-Victorian society and with which the writer was so much concerned. Yet never amid these soaring grandiloquies does Wells ever fail to portray the unique and individual nature of those who fought for these ideas and those who fought against them. Young and thoughtless as I must have been when first I read this novel, one of the descriptions that remained strongest in my mind at the time was that of Mrs. Skinner, slatternly and small-minded, yet turning back before she left the experimental farm to leave a few buckets of water to slake the thirst of what she thought of as those poor little chicks, birds the size of emus. It was contradictory to her nature, it was real. And as for realism, well, I've said that Wells is important to us now because what he wrote 70 odd years ago about the way people behave remains as true now as doubtless it will remain for all the millennia to come. Even as he reached for the stars, his feet touched bedrock. Consider his description of the politician, Caterham. He did not know that there were physical laws and economic laws, quantities and reactions that all humanity voting, I mean contra de sante, cannot vote away, and that are disobeyed only at the price of destruction. He did not know that there are moral laws that cannot be bent by any force of glamour, or that are bent only to fly back with vindictive violence. In the face of shrapnel or the judgement day, it was evident that this man would have sheltered behind some curiously dodged vote of the House of Commons. Wells could have been writing today about, well, I won't be nasty, but I'm sure you know who I mean. I mean, it depends when it was written. Margaret Thatcher? 1976. Too early for Thatcher, I think. So, uh, there's just a line here which I really enjoyed. Um, that, of course, was a ridiculous dream, but it shows the state of mental excitement into which Mr. Bensington got and the real value he attached to his idea, much better than any of the things he said or did when he was awakened on his guard. Or I should not have mentioned it, because as a general rule, it is not, I think, at all interesting for people to tell each other about their dreams. Amen. And so I'm going to read this little bit when somebody meets one of the giant wasps. When he came to measure the thing, he found it was 27 and a half inches across its open wings, and its sting was three inches long. The abdomen was blown clean off from its body, but he estimated the length of the creature from head to sting as 18 inches, which is very nearly correct. Its compound eyes were the size of penny pieces. That is the first authenticated appearance of the giant wasps. The day after, a cyclist riding feet up down the hill between Seven Oaks and Tunbridge very narrowly missed running over a second of these giants that was crawling across the roadway. His passage seemed to alarm it, and it rose with a noise like a sawmill. His bicycle jumped the footpath in the emotion of the moment, and when he could look back, the wasp was soaring away above the woods towards Westerham. After riding unsteadily for a little time, he put on his brake, dismounted. He was trembling so violently that he fell over his machine in doing so, and sat down by the roadside to recover. He had intended to ride to Ashford, but he did not get beyond Tunbridge that day. After that, curiously enough, there is no record of any big wasps being seen for three days. I find, on consulting the meteorological record of those days, that they were overcast and chilly with local showers, which may perhaps account for this intermission. Then on the fourth day came blue sky and brilliant sunshine, and such an outburst of wasps as the world had surely never seen before. How many big wasps came out that day is impossible to guess. 
There are at least 50 accounts of their apparition. There was one victim, a grocer, who discovered one of those monsters in a sugar cask and very rashly attacked it with a spade as it rose. He struck it to the ground for a moment and it stung him through the boot as he struck at it again and cut its body in halves. He was the first dead of the two. There's a character in this called Redwood as well, which is just great naming because obviously the theme of these giant plants and animals and stuff. And uh, here we have a little bit of foreshadowing, which I enjoyed as well. You've told us all about that, said Redwood. The thing is, Bensington, what are we to do? What are we to do, said Mr. Skinner. You'll have to go back to Mrs. Skinner, said Redwood. You can't leave her there alone all night. Not alone, though, I don't. Not if there was a dozen Mrs. Skinners. It's Mr. Bensington. Nonsense, said Redwood. The wasps will be all right at night and the earwigs will get out of your way. But what about the rats? There aren't any rats, said Redwood. By the way, that uh, lisp is spelled out phonetically, that's why I did it. And I thought this was cool because this showed, and quite realistically I think, what like the uh, response from society would be like. Then comes the question of school accommodation. Cost of enlarged desks and forms for our already too greatly burned at national schools. And to get what? A proletariat of hungry giants. Winds up with a very serious passage. Says even if this wild suggestion, mere passing fancy of mine, you know, and misinterpreted at that, this wild suggestion about the schools comes to nothing. That doesn't end the matter. This is a strange food, so strange as to seem to him almost wicked. It has been scattered recklessly, so he says, and it may be scattered again. Once you've taken it, it's poison unless you go on with it. So it is, said Bensington. And in short, he proposes the formation of a national society for the preservation of the proper proportions of things. Odd, eh? People are hanging on to the idea like anything. But what do they propose to do? Winkle shrugged his shoulders and threw out his hands. Form a society, he said, and fuss. They want to make it illegal to manufacture this heraclophobia, or at any rate to circulate the knowledge of it. I've written about a bit to show that Caterham's idea of the stuff is very much exaggerated. Very much exaggerated indeed, but that doesn't seem to check it. Curious how people are turning against it. And the National Temperance Association, by the by, has formed a branch for temperance and growth. And this kind of shows us how fast humans grew with it when, when it was fed to babies, basically. By the time this baby was 12 months old, he measured just one inch under five feet high and scaled eight stone three. He was as big, in fact, as a San Pietro and Vaticano cherub, and his affectionate clutch at the hair and features of visitors became the talk of West Kensington. They had an invalid's chair to carry him up and down to his nursery, and his special nurse, a muscular young person just out of training, used to take him out for his airings in a panard eight horsepower hill climbing perambulator specially made to meet his requirements. And uh, this final bit I want to read out here, again, this is like they're trying to deal with the problem of like, what do you do with these massive people, you know? Look at them! And I know their father, a brute, a sort of brute beast with an intolerant loud voice, a creature who has run amuck in our all too merciful world for the last 30 years and more, an engineer. To him, all that we hold dear and sacred is nothing, nothing. The splendid traditions of our race and land, the noble institutions, the venerable order, the broad slow march from precedent to precedent that has made our English people great and this sunny island free. It is all an idle tale told and done with. Some claptrap about the future is worth all these sacred things. This sort of man who would run a tramway over his mother's grave if he thought that was the cheapest line the tramway could take. And you think to temporise, to make some scheme of compromise that will enable you to live in your way while that, that machinery lives in it. I tell you it is hopeless, hopeless, as well make treaties with a tiger. They want things monstrous, we want them sane and sweet. It is one thing or the other. But what can you do? Much, all, stop the food. They are still scattered, these giants, still immature and disunited. Chain them, gag them, muzzle them. At any cost, stop them. It is their world or ours. Stop the food. Shut up these men who make it. Do anything to stop Kossar. You don't seem to remember. One generation, only one generation needs holding down. And then, then we could level those mounds there, fill up their footsteps, take the ugly sirens from our church towers, smash all our elephant guns and turn our faces again to the old order, the ripe old civilization for which the soul of man is fitted. It's a mighty effort. For a mighty end. And if we don't, don't you see the prospect before as clear as day? Everywhere the giants will increase and multiply, everywhere they will make and scatter the food. The grass will grow gigantic in our fields, the weeds in our hedges, the vermin in the thickets, the rats in the drains, more and more and more. This is only a beginning. The insect world will rise on us, the plant world, the very fishes in the sea will swamp and drown our ships. Tremendous growths will obscure and hide our houses, smother our churches, smash and destroy all the order of our cities, and we should become no more than a feeble vermin under the heels of the new race. Mankind will be swamped and drowned in things of its own begetting. And all for nothing, size, mere size, enlargement and decapo. Already we go picking our way among the first beginnings of the coming time. And all we do is to say how inconvenient to grumble and do nothing. No. But it's a tough thing, you know, like, you can't just wipe out 
a generation of these giants or whatever. So yeah, that's about all I have to share with you from The Food of the Gods by H.G. E. Wells. I gave this a four out of five. I thought it was really fascinating. I love the concept. And, and as I say, I do think it holds its own against the best of H.G. E. Wells as well. So uh, yeah, would recommend. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Food of the Gods by H.G. Wells. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.